Welcome to Soul Night Live, episode number 67. Tonight, our guests are Billy Sherwood, Jimmy Hahn, Jay Shellen, and Dave Kirzner from the new Yes Offshoot, Arc of Life. Well, thanks for taking the time to come by and chat today. The new album's out, and it's all the buzz this week. We've seen a lot of, a lot of talk about it. So, I, you, know, you know, the thing about musical forums is people spend a lot of time speculating about what's going on in your heads when you make something. And I want to just cut to the chase and ask <laughs> rather than this, you know, woulda, shoulda, coulda business that people seem a lot, to specialize a lot of, in. A lot of this. Okay. Happen. Um, it's just a creative process when you're working on music in general and it all starts from songwriting. And so it's all about getting that started so that you know what you're going to do with it. And then once you've got that idea and you pass it around your, your band, you know, things get flushed out on a level that take it to another place. And, and that's what it's really all about. Very cool. Um, now, when did this all become, let me ask you this. I understand that you and John started working on some of this stuff a few years back, like on yeah. the road with yes in the back of the bus. So I'm wondering, did, did, where, when did you realize, hey, we've got a band here? Or did, was that the thought from the very beginning before you started writing? No, it was definitely not the thought at the beginning. I mean, we were just killing time writing and I always travel with my studio. And so things get captured and <clears throat> we had instruments everywhere around us and we just started writing songs. And once we had two or three things developed, they were kind of obvious to he and I that it was like, this is something more than songwriting but it wasn't like destined for a yes thing or anything so low and whatnot. It was, it was to become something bigger. And then it was that point that we kind of realized we need to build a band here and who better to go to than our homeboys here, Jay, uh, Jimmy and Dave. And we sort of agreed to put this thing together and be a band. That was a lengthy period of time. I just suggested there from between 2017 and 2000, <clears throat> but that's how yes. it developed yes. and that's how it happened, you know? Okay, and um, how did you uh, decide to get Mr. Kersner involved? It's always always good to hear him on anything, but uh, yeah. Dave and I have been threatening <laughs> to do something for a long time together, um, and I've worked on a bunch of his stuff and vice versa, and, and it just, as soon as we started talking to keyboard players, it was like, well, we want someone who's not only super talented on keys and knows sounds, which Dave obviously does, with his company that he's got, you know? So, but it was more to do with <clears throat> having another voice in the band that could sing because, you know, my, John and myself and, and Jimmy and Dave, there's four really strong voices there. And as you can tell, this album is filled with harmony, you know? And, and we gave him five bucks to do it. He still hangs on to it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, plus, yeah. frame. plus we're all buddies from the the cruise of the edge well you know, yeah we, that we run into each other all the time so we know it's a great hang you know and that's that's an important thing too you know well it seems like a really cool a pairing course. you know i've heard dave's other work and it's it's all really cool stuff so yeah oh yeah good good move there definitely and the three of you you know we've heard you guys you know, play music together on and off for 20 years now. So it's cool to see. 26. You know, Billy, I was thinking about this. World Trade Euphoria was 95. Well, but even before that, you and I, where we started, was on my solo album, which was before that. Yeah. Holy crap. That was the tail end of 94, I think. It started, you know, boom, and just hit it. Yeah. Or no, maybe it was the other way around. Maybe it was World yeah. Trade first. Yeah, because remember the first tracks we cut were the stuff that was you finishing. Oh, right. We did in your Euphoria. Mind. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That wow. and some tennis, getting some tennis in at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to hear all about Jim and, I, Jim and I go way, way back. I mean, you know, that's Jimmy and Mike were responsible for me understanding all of the music that's become the stuff I listened to over the years because they were older than me, five years older, you know? So, you know, Jim and I go way, way back. Four and a half. Four and a way half. back. You were, you were practically his babysitter. <laughs> no, I was his babysitter. Yeah. No, that's what I mean. <laughs> oh yeah. His mom loved me. loved me. He's, she was like, 
you're the only one Billy likes to hang out with. And, you know, Billy, I guess at that point was probably about six or something. And uh, I understood, you know, like he loved Hot Wheels and stuff. And <laughs> I mean, and I did too, you know. I still do. Yeah. <laughs> so I was his babysitter, you know. Oh, that's awesome. Before, but the funniest uh, story, yeah. which the funniest story of that sort of period of being a kid, we're all kids. Uh, they were five years older. So like when they were reaching 15, 16, they were jamming, smoking weed, you know, whatever was going on in the room. And I was the kid who was too young to come in and see any of that stuff. So while they were playing yes, close to the edge in there, I'd be banging on the door to get into the garage and the Tom Fletcher's place. And, and they wouldn't let me in, you know? <laughs> oh, how the tables have turned. That's right. Right. <laughs> right. 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 It's like, don't open the door. The smoke will knock him out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. So Funny. I want to hear about the new record, but I kind of wanted to go around the room and kind of catch up on what each of you have been doing just lately on a day-to-day -day basis, any musical stuff or, or otherwise. Um, Jimmy, what have you been up to? Oh, I, um, I'm actually working with uh, my friend Jonathan Elias, and we're doing this library for Universal. And then um, uh, my great friend Ditto, who I've done like, I guess about five movies with now. <clears throat> he has a new movie. So uh, we're, we're working on that. And, uh, uh, you know, there, there's, there's a bunch of new projects coming up. But uh, I mean, this is, this is uh, you know, the, the one that I'm so into right now is, is, is the Arc of Life. Uh, yeah. So, you know, I'm, I'm really devoting a lot of my time and, you know, everything to this and uh you know and plus i do commercials too on the side you know quite a bit um i've, I've done that for, work. for years yeah for like so many years um but uh it's, I mean, it's really it's really exciting to be working with billy again you know it's 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 been god since circa which was back in 2010 i think is when uh, I I left the band or you know something and uh, how about headsets? Headsets. Headsets. Right? You know, Billy, I was just thinking about that the other day, man. Yeah. Like, who? I mean, Dan Schmally was in that band, right? <laughs> oh my god! Oh, Never? I forgot all about that. <laughs> Jay, you were in the band, right? Yeah. And yeah. Tony. Tony. And Tony. Tony. God, I, and then Jim Ladd as the voice. Ladd. That's yeah. right. And they were great. It was a blast to do them. That's for sure. It was. Smally. <laughs> oh, my they, God. You know, Jim's being kind of modest. They call him the Jingle Jedi. And, uh, you know, Jim's the guy who wrote Yahoo. So, that's I mean, you? That, that yeah. Hillbilly Yodel, that, you did that? Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah, it, it's amazing. With the little banjo in the background and everything. Was that you, too? Hey. Hey man, I, I wrote so many other things, but you know that one. Everybody remembers that one. You know, it's, that's your that's your owner of a lonely heart right there. Right? <laughs> we're gonna um, we're gonna Lonely perform. Yahoo. We're gonna do the twenty minute version of that live. There you go. Yeah, <laughs> it'll be a long vowel, man. <laughs> so if you're hanging out with Elias, can we ask for a symphonic reworking of the Union album anytime in the future? Oh wow. <laughs> wow I, I never even thought about that you know that album has such a clouded history as we all know oh i know I man. think a lot of the band are, don't even want to talk about it or have it well, listened no. to it since it yeah. came out but you know as a fan i kind of liked it you know did you really yeah all the laundry i didn't know about any of that in the early oh. 90s it wasn't until 10 years later i heard the 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 scoop and by then i didn't really care because I, I like a lot of those songs you know you know how yesy it is. I don't know. I mean, we could argue about that for days, but we won't yeah. get anywhere. You it's know, it's so. really funny how that all came about because Billy came from the other side. He was on the yes side. I came from the Anderson Bruford Wakeman House side, and and it was a combination of two albums really that were in process of being made. So Here's decided, a, what's this that? is part. This is part of that history, which is, is not very widely known because I don't really talk about it a lot, but since we're here having fun, 
and Chris would appreciate this and be laughing himself. So that's the only reason I know I can tell this. Yeah. But I got a letter from um, John Anderson and Steve that would you like to play bass on this record? And that's when you guys were on that side working with Tony Levin and some other bass players. And, and so Jonathan sent me the bass stuff and, and I did it as a demo and it was all systems go. And then, so the next uh, time I saw Chris, which was shortly after that, I was very excited and naive to the whole yes thing at that point. And so I said to Chris, man, they want me to play on this. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm going to go play on this. He goes, oh, you can't do that. You're working with us. Right. I, okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I checked this out. I said, wait, wait a minute. What do you mean I can't do it? It's a, it's a paying session. You know, I'm a musician. What do you mean? You know? yeah. He goes, dude, you can't do that. The loyal And so, you know, I said, all right, Chris, I understand. And I passed on it. Fast forward three weeks later, he comes in, looks at me and laughs and goes, I just did the bass sessions on the union stuff. <laughs> Oh, oh, uh, it was classic. Yeah. But you know what? It's sort of you could see that whole thing coming. And that was the period where they wanted me to be the lead singer. And I stepped out of the way because, you know, everyone thought it was a great idea but me. And because I could see that coming, that that union of these guys, the lawyers were swarming, the managers. It was you could read it like a yeah. book that it was coming. Yeah. Yeah, I was happy to step out of the way, but I, I think, you know, the more we live is on there and the work Jim did and yeah. I see my brother singing on that other side too, which is quite cool. And Steve yeah. Picaro's on there. It's a different Yes album in that studio musicians were involved. That's yeah. for sure. Yep, that's for yeah, sure. But still Yesy music, you know, at the end yeah. of the day, you know, John Anderson's bag of fairy dust was sprinkled liberally all over it. And that yeah. Really, yeah, really gets it there. some on me. But it must have been really kind of weird for you to, you know, be asked to play stuff. You know, it's like Steve Howe isn't Steve Howe enough for us. No, at the exactly. No, and, yeah. and, and and dude, I and mean, he's like one of your, you know, heroes. You know, so yeah, it's been kind of weird. Well, it's weird, and and uh, I remember the road manager came in, and uh, you know, he was like, "Wow, you even kind of look like Steve Howe." You know, uh, that's Brian Lane. Yeah. Right, mm -hmm. Brian Lane, Billy, is that right? <laughs> Brian, yeah, that was who was managing. Brian, yeah, yeah. I was getting mixed up with another Brian. But do, you remember, do you remember? We jammed on we we jammed on yes stuff though so religiously. You know, Jimmy and I were so together on that yes thing that you know, I mean, his love for Steve is like my love. For Chris is playing, and that's we, right. You know, Same comes thing. Through the DNA. Yeah. You know, at one point we were, uh, when, I think when we were working on the Logic record at record one, we even kind of posed in a picture with this clock to sort of <laughs> stimulate Chris and Steve. Yep. So we were fans and into it. And we were yeah. younger at that point. As I said, I was kind of naive to what Yes really was about. And, you know, yeah. I've learned yeah. a lot. What I wondered about is how much of the stuff that Steve laid down did they play for you and go fix that? And what did oh. you think of it? Were you going, oh, this is fine. What am I, you don't need to do no. that. Or were you like, gosh, that needs no, some more. No, dude, I, I, I wasn't digging it. I, I mean, I'm, I hate to say it, but I mean, it, it sounded like Steve had this freaking buzz box and just like soloed over everything. And I understand why Arista, you know, was concerned because there was no other colors really. I don't think Steve really cared much about what was going on musically right then. You know what I mean? It seemed like that. Uh, so I just tried to dial into, you know, more of his colors and stuff like that, you know, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, that's what, that was my impression at first. It was just like, he really didn't, really wasn't too into it, you know? He wasn't so, digging that album, that batch of two. I don't think any of them were really into it. Yeah. yeah. I think yeah. it was, it was really a, a play to get it all together and get it on the road more than anything, I think. Oh yeah, well the yeah. tour, you know, the tour was, was a worth big tour. All, everything else, you know, in the long run. But, but yeah, just musically, I don't, I don't hate it like a lot of people do. I think it's, it's a pretty, kind of a cool album, you know. At the time, well, it was, if you want to hate a Yes album? Let's start talking about Open Your Eyes and just. <laughs> <laughs> no, That's man. a great album. It's a fun <laughs> record. It's got a <laughs> lot of energy. You know, hey, yeah. it is what it is. It is. Well, <laughs> um, okay. So Jay, how have you been spending your days lately? Good, you know, everything's good. It, everything kind of came to a grinding halt, you know? Sure. I mean, for the last, oh, man, eight, nine years from playing in Vegas, 
with Raiding the Rock Vault, which was an every night gig, driving back, you know, for a day, day and a half, back to Vegas. What are your, some of your favorite classics to play with them? Oh, well, I mean, the lineup was insane. You know, there's Howard Lease. Yeah, uh, Hart, yeah. Yeah, and uh, Tracy Guns was in it for a bit. Um, Hugh McDonald, you know, Bon Jovi's bass player. Uh, Robin McCauley, Paul Shortino. Great players, Michael T. Ross on keyboards. It, it was a great band. Yeah. yeah. So I would say playing some Deep Purple stuff was great because we really let it out while we were playing it, you know, and Howard and then uh, some Zeppelin stuff was really good because Tracy Guns was amazing at playing Jimmy Page. Just the right amount of slop, you know what I mean? Right, it was really right. perfect. Yeah, yeah. Be too tidy. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And But the singers were all just, you know, just superlative vocalists. So. And then we had dancing girls and all that too. So it was entertaining for me because I'm in the back. <laughs> for the drummer. And it's, yeah. it's a beautiful, you know, so it was a lot of fun. But I'm recording stuff for them during this downtime. So recording tracks for Phil Susan and for Paul Shortino. He did a solo record. Yeah, okay. um, yeah we all remember that hit that Phil and, uh, with Ozzy back in Then also uh, some stuff with Howard and, you know, some things like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, then Billy and I have been working consistently. You know, there's there's things that need to get done. And uh, we've been doing it for like, like I said, 26 years. So in, in my own uh, studio here, I crank out stuff all the time, different producers, you know, all over the place, get the records done, get it, you know, that kind of thing. I got a Vegas question for you, Vegas guys. I'm kind of fascinated with old Vegas. And I'm wondering, what's your favorite old school casino, dead or alive? The what oldest what? Say that again. What's your favorite old school casino in Vegas? Oh, well, man, the, you know, there's not many of them left anymore. That, I, mean, I, Billy's mean, from, I mean, Billy's from Vegas, but... I mean, if you're going to go old school, yeah, we, were, we, were in, we were at the Tropicana for okay. several years. So I'll pick that one because I know it really well, you know. How about you, Bill? I have to say the Dunes. The Dunes? For multiple yeah. reasons. Um, my middle name is Wyman, and I'm named after the, who owned the Dunes. That's this right. Did Wyman. Okay. So that hotel has a special memory in that way. And it also was the hotel where Jim's dad was for many, many years singing in the main room. And Jim could tell you more about that, but yeah, the dunes. The dunes. And then, and then we can't forget the landmark because the landmark. that's right. And that's when uh, I joined your parents and we played at the top of the landmark for like uh, two years. Oh, that, that's the one that got mm-hmm. zapped in Mars Attacks, isn't it? <laughs> it's well, well look at that. it's the one that James Bond hangs from the elevator out of in Live and Let Die. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> the landmark. Yeah. yeah, but you know, we started at the LVH, which was the old Hilton, right? Where uh, you know, ve- uh, Elvis, Elvis, yeah, you, you gotta for years and years and years, and, years. and they kept a piece, an original piece of the stage. It's about three feet by four feet right in the back and it's a huge stage beautiful room um and that hotel is amazing that's the old international oh yeah yeah so that's that's rat packish all that stuff three thousand rooms in that place huge yeah and they they that was fantastic i really hated leaving that hotel but then we went to the tropicana so i guess both of those are fairly old school now billy didn't you see yes in 77 at one of those hotels Saw them at yeah, the Aladdin. Uh, Aladdin. Aladdin. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I I actually met John Anderson and his then wife, uh, whose name escapes me at the time, but uh, they were very kind and very sweet. And yeah, I was uh, eleven or twelve. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you, you rubbed the lamp, and John Anderson came out of it, right? Right. And, <laughs> and just, I remember seeing that concert and walking away a different person yeah, just all too. together in my head of like, wow, you know what? I know now what I must do. That's you know, right. Like, that changed then, here. Yeah. And I was thinking about being a blackjack dealer. So it, it may have worked itself out to go <laughs> to the concert. <laughs> yeah, also, wow. there was an omen 
because I, I heard the, the story where the slot machine, three tomatoes came up. And that was like, <laughs> this uh, must have something. <laughs> exactly. Flat. I just remember, I remember searching that hotel high and low for Chris, and I did not find him. Right. <laughs> so, I remember finding that that gig. I remember finding John or um, Alan White and Steve Howe, and I followed Alan White. He went and tried on a suit. I remember in this place. You know, I was what seventeen, I think, yeah. and and I saw Steve Howe, and we like there was this group of people that just followed Steve, yeah. and nobody knew what to say to him, and wow. he and he like. He brought out these pictures and everybody was just like so like enamored by it. it's Steve Howe, you know, what uh, do we say? Yeah. And I was part of that. I, I really didn't say much to him, you know, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, that was like phew, Steve. But Vegas, so Vegas, changed, Vegas has changed so much now that, I mean, just yeah. to stand Caesars <laughs> in, on that corner. I don't recognize anything much. Yeah. 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 No, it's really different. Yeah. Uh, I spent more time on the golf courses than I did in the casinos. Right. Yeah. right. Seriously. I stayed out of trouble. It was good because, I mean, that was a six, seven-year run, man. I mean, there's a lot of trouble you can get in Vegas, man, oh. in that length of time. You betcha. And there's it, a lot of holes in the desert. Did you, did you guys ever uh, catch the old <laughs> – remember the old series Vegas with Dan Tana? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I love watching that, just watching oh, the old – it's great. Stuff, I mean, you know? all the stuff around Vegas is is entertaining, man. It's yeah. really entertaining. Yeah. yeah. Great town. Great town. Definitely. Um, so Dave, what have you been up to? Uh, I've been using this uh, isolation lockdown time to kind of catch up on a whole bunch of unfinished albums to mix. I've got my live albums uh, for my solo band and then in continuum, uh, which is another band I have, which, which John Davis, who couldn't make it here, by the way, he's got some Wi-Fi issues where he is right now so uh he apologizes uh but um and then uh, i i'm writing a, a solo record and and then i've got these tribute records that i started many of which billy's on actually and uh like rush there's one for rush one for genesis one for pink floyd i'm just going to try to get those all out you know i, I keep putting them on the back burner because i want to do original stuff but they're really good. And, and um, of course, Billy is on um, Black Floyd, which is the McBroom Sisters album, which came out recently. Yeah. That's uh, the backing vocalist wow. from Pink Floyd singing oh, lead nice. on Pink Floyd songs and original songs. And Billy plays on that, pulls apart and a bunch of stuff. Uh, but so that's out. But then I've got all these other ones that we did with Alan Parsons. And, you know, Billy and I tend to do these kinds of things. Sometimes we play on each other's, you know, I so I always hire Billy because he's just, I tell people like this is the fastest session musician I've ever worked with. Like literally like before I'm done finishing the sentence, it goes, here's a track. <laughs> no, it's like same day. But uh, well, so, I, you know, I'm just getting all that stuff done. I was going to say, you know, it used to be, you know, when you go to the studio, and there was the bowl of fruit and, you know, the control room and you put your feet up and all you wanted to do was hang out in this room, man, because it was so cool. And then fast forward 35 years or so, <laughs> you just want to get the session done. <laughs> yeah. The, the, yeah. So, yeah. The luster is worn off. <laughs> right. Yeah, I hear you. Um, well, very cool. Um, so I had Alan on a couple of weeks ago with Tony Levin and David Torn. It was really cool to get all three of them in the same room. That had never happened in, in ever, wow. at least in, in this modern age. And, um, Talked a bit about the new Yes album. I was wondering if maybe you could tell us a little bit about it. Um, he he spoke as if it was pretty much done and being mixed. Am I right, or is that a little far along? Dave, <laughs> I don't have um, the inside scoop on that. <laughs> when you you broke up a little when you said I want to talk about, and then I did oh, hear <laughs> <sorry about that. laughs> Uh did he say stuff about it? He's not supposed to. That's uh, all I can. Well, I, <laughs> actually, I didn't ask. He just kind of brought it up and I went with it. He does that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let me see. Yeah. What do we talk about? He said it's almost being mixed. He tracked drums. There's a tune called Ice Bridges. So now everybody's right. calling the album Ice Bridges. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's a weird thing to be in, yes. 
the levels of security that are involved. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> to put this bluntly, I've been asked not to talk about it. Security <laughs> alert, security yeah. alert. Exactly. All right, well, all right they'll just. Um, I don't, you know, I'll, what I can say, you know, because I've been asked this a few times and, you know, I'm always in the same position here. And then what I can say is it has bass, drums, guitar, keys, and vocals. That I know. Okay, those are good. That's always a nice combination. <laughs> Beyond that, I can't really. Any kazan or uh, banjo? Yeah. Yeah, right. Um, and I'm feeling good about it. Let's put it that way, too. You know, for whatever that's worth to anybody out there, I'm, I'm feeling good about where it's going. How did the writing parse out? Did you write a chunk of it and the other guys did, or is it more collaborative? Uh, well, it was, you know, it's a tricky one. Okay. And again, I'm sort of sworn to secrecy there on levels that, like, I'm not sure if Alan was supposed to have told you anything. <laughs> <laughs> on those levels. <laughs> There's levels. You will, you will be killed. All right. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't. All roads lead back to Billy. Did it, so I'm definitely not putting my foot into anything. I hear you. That's all right. Well, we've got a fresh <laughs> album to talk about today, anyway. So there you go. Yeah. Yes, can wait. <laughs> uh huh. So, um, how do you decide when a song's good for Yes versus Circa versus Arc of Life? Well, wow, the last. Yes, song I was involved with writing, you know, is going back to the latter. So I don't really have a, I mean, that thought isn't in my head because I've written so much music between now and when I, you sure. know, I was there. Um, I think that there's an expectation just because of the DNA of the association of being in the band that the things that I do, I'm immediately thinking for yes, when the reality is I have. You know, I've done my Citizen project, which there's three record or two records out now, three prog collectives, Circa, Yoso. There's been so much material, and it all has its own unique shape and form and feel. Um, so, again, you know, going back to where we started, you know, when John and I were writing, we were just writing, and and we knew this isn't destined for yes. You know, we're writing for something else. So, just kind of a I don't know. I guess people in the association are going to connect those dots, but they don't really exist in the room when you're writing the song so much. The inspiration yeah. comes first, right? That's the yeah, thing. you just you do what you do, and I write. You know what I mean? And it's like yeah. I've been involved with Yes now for so long that the assumption is everything I write must be, I must be thinking about Yes, but there's a lot more going on in the my satellite world around the mothership. Sure. Um, I'm hearing that we're still getting a little bit of feedback. I don't know if anybody's talk back is kind of loud, but if we right. can cut it down a little bit volume bit, yeah. wise, that might. might help. So, um, is that me? I no. I can't put my finger on who it is. Yeah. Hey, your I'll turn my volume down. Okay. That might help a little bit. There we go. Well, I'm still kind of getting I'm still here. Am I all right? Uh, I think so. Okay. I, I hear something. Okay. Try and make the best of it. Right. Uh, it, won't, it talk it, more. It, <laughs> I'm just entertaining my girlfriend over here. So, sorry, guys. So, so it's safe to say that none of these songs on the on the new album were ever considered for yes. As a matter of fact, some of these songs you've had around for a few years and uh, kind of reworked for this. Am I right? Yeah, I mean, uh, these were all written, as I said, between 2017 with other ideas that we threw in from the past here and there. But for the most part, it was all, it's all from scratch, fresh stuff, you know. Um, and I think that was something we were excited about because we just started writing because we wanted to and we were inspired. What I find funny now is because I've done many interviews at this point, is that the kind of question of the lyrics relating to COVID and this experience we're going through and how lockdown must be about COVID. And the reality is we, we wrote that before and it's not really about COVID, but it tends to work in the listener's mind that way or until further notice, you know, a song like that. So it's interesting how some of the lyrics get perceived 
in a time frame where we weren't you know what i mean yeah. so but how that's up to the listener and i i like it that way you know it's not pegged at a certain time well i'm digging the vibe of the record you know your music always has kind of an underlying kind of sunny optimistic vibe even when you're talking about stuff that seems a little you know serious uh, you always well i mean you know i'm I'm an eternal optimist and always have been. And, you know, yes was the soundtrack to my life. And, and that, that one word, you know, just sort of translates into my way of thinking, which is anything's possible and just keep going forward, you know? Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, life comes with its fair share of darkness. We all know that I lost my brother last November. So these things happen, but we live on for those we've lost. Chris Squire, for instance, you know, I mean, his wish was yes, go on. And so that's what we do. And so we live for the ones that have fallen and, but we've got to live well because, you know, that's why I used to think of the first tour I did when Chris was gone, there were parts of me that were really sad. And, and I think people could see that on stage. And I, I started thinking that this isn't what Chris would want. He wouldn't want me up here, you know, crying and kind of depressed looking. So try to put a brave face on it and then as time goes by you know things get a little better but it's just an optimistic viewpoint that i think permeates what i do even when i'm trying to write something dark and depressing i want to put some spin or way out lyrically that there's a hope and a, and a light sort of at the end of the tunnel of things yeah well i can you can just kind of feel it there's kind of an underlying vibe that, that i think is, is great yeah. you know so I think well, yes I, is yes is a positive band anyway, you know. Really. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Positive word, you know. So. Yep. When I wanted to get super depressed, I just put on the wall, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Um you know, that makes me want to stop and ask. Have, have any of you heard Stephen Wilson's new one that everybody's talking about this week? I have mm. not. Okay. Yeah, yet but i you know don't ask me i'm working so much in the studio on stuff that when i'm done the last thing i want to do is listen to anyone's music that's right let's say do you guys just listen to music for fun or are you just so burnt out there you really don't want to talk? i'm burnt by the time i'm done working on stuff i just want to put on vr and go somewhere where gunshots are firing and there's explosions. Yeah. <laughs> just so i can hear anything but tone and music and notes yeah, you know? yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. How about you, Jay? Is it, get a chance to listen for enjoyment or for for Brian's record? No, for just anything in general. What do you listen to for fun around the house? Oh man, it just it just uh, kind of goes all over the place, man. I mean, I listen to I love working with horses, and I hang out quite a bit with a lot of you know country folk. I listen to some country, um, and then I go back to. Genesis. I love still listening to a lot of Genesis. Um, Brand X, just kind of, you know, the things that always inspired me before. You know? Right. And then some newer stuff. There's some new artists that I think are pretty cool. Aaliyah is one. It's very heavy, but it's really creative and it's really, it's kind of good upward lyrics and things like that. But I, think I like, agree with Billy is after you've slammed away, you know, in the studio and you've done some editing and you've done all that. I, I just feel like, you know, at that point, I just go saddle a horse and go out in the middle of nowhere. Well, sure. Just listen to the birds. <laughs> you know, what's funny though, is, is the, the, the time that I will listen and bring my iPod and really check out and go back to those things that I love to listen to is on the road because you're stuck. You have yeah. you're in an airport, you're in a car, you're, you know, waiting in a hotel lobby whatever and i remember many times me and jay because you know i i like to drive so i drive i drive me oh. jay and john all over the country when we tour i still Dude. can't believe you did that man i mean seriously right. i we know seven, we would do a seven hour car drive hitting well, every starbucks every starbucks exit sign that yeah. showed up on the road right. no, it's going yeah. by we're off billy yeah seven i've been there with you billy hour drive sure. yeah <laughs> And we would get in seven hours and the other guys flew. And so they'd be at the hotel, Steve and Alan and everybody, and, and they're fresh. We're pulling in. Well, we have about 45 minutes to grab a shower, choke down a protein bar or whatever, <laughs> your coffee, and head straight to sound check. Yeah. 
That happened well, that was, more than a couple of times, man, with John, too, when we had the three of us together. Yeah, I know. I still don't <laughs> see how you did it. I call Billy Spartacus. I mean, I know it's been used a lot, but he earned it. Yeah, he definitely did. But what I was going to say is on those drives, because as you said, we just have a lot of time. Yeah. Jay and I, you know, we'd be in the front just like, oh, remember Mahavishnu this or Return to Forever that. You know, Unfortunately, we just lost Chick Korea, which is yeah. really Yeah, yeah that's low. a sad one. But, you know, for me, when I do listen to music, I go to the fountain that I created a long, long time ago. Most of it was the stuff yeah. Jimmy and Mike turned me on to. Pat Metheny, Genesis, Floyd, Deep Purple, oh, you know, all yeah. that stuff. Yeah. yeah, we dive into, on those, those, those drives, we dive into both of our influences and stuff. We're pulling out old David Sanctus and Tone records, you know. Exactly. And... and Return to Forever stuff. And David will be yeah. on my show next week. So, who oh, really? David yeah, cool. Anxious. Yes. Oh yeah, God, wicked. that's great. Yeah. Oh, definitely tell him I said hello. I will. I'll give him your best. Definitely. He's been on yeah. several of the Prog Collectors, and he's yeah. I, I thoroughly right. love those records he did back in the seventies. You know, like this one. Uh, yeah. What's oh, his yeah. final transformation? I think. Absolutely. My yeah, favorite man. is uh, True Stories. That's a great album. That's yep, great. One. That's the one. I love that album. Forest of Feelings, that's a great one too. Yeah. 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 Alex Legerwood singing. Yeah. Awesome. awesome. So good. I know. Amazing. But you know what's funny is after we would take these car rides and we'd be doing the Mahavishnu to, you know, Phil Collins to whatever gambit that yeah. night we'd be playing. And we knew what we had been hearing jokes all day long, the whole thing but then also the music and we'd throw in these key little licks during, right. during the yes stuff, just, just a little thing. And Billy would turn around and go, Oh yeah, yeah I know oh, what yeah, that was. That is, yeah. But then the funniest <laughs> thing is, is in between when Steve is talking, Billy will come up to the drum rack, right? Now he's facing me and I'm facing the audience. So, I mean, and he starts telling me jokes and we're going <laughs> back over these jokes, you know, and, I got to keep a straight face because I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to bode well for me if I'm just like cracking up on the drums here. Uh, Steve is giving a, you know, a heartfelt, you know, speech and stuff. Yeah. Uh, that was the funniest great. memory I have of, uh, you know, that's one of my favorite things to do to take a break and put my right left hand up and just lean on, on Jay's yeah. rack. I could just sort of <laughs> chill for a minute between songs while other stuff's going on. Sometimes I think one... the rack is holding you up. <laughs> There was there was one night where I was a little bit spacey, if you know what I'm saying, and um, I kind of lean up on his rack and he's looking at me and I said to him, I kind of forgot what song we were going to go into next. And so I looked at him and I went, is this the one that goes dun, 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 dun? <laughs> <laughs> That's the one that goes doogie, doogie, doogie. <laughs> yeah. Just the one that goes dun, 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 dun. He goes, yeah. Yeah, said, yeah, yeah. yeah. We're all. <laughs> Exactly. As I'm counting it off, I'm going, yeah, yeah, that's it. And never <laughs> missed a beat. Thank you. <laughs> that, that makes me a question for you guys. You know, just the fact that you've covered so many Yes songs and dusted off so many that maybe hadn't been touched in decades. What were some of your favorites? Like when you, ones where you're just like, I can't believe we're finally playing this song. This is so awesome. Gates of Delirium. Oh, yeah. 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 That's probably Gates. One. Gates and, and even, for me, uh, ritual because you know yeah. the bass work in ritual is so good. No doubt. And, you know there was just such a blast to just shred through that solo every night. It was fun. Oh, those are cool. still my favorites. Those are my favorites, Billy. Because yeah. that was that was that was the summer that I got the call to come in for that tour, and it was topographic, right? But yeah. also it was um, you know other other stuff. Of course, the hits. And, and then Drama, which to me was the record that I hadn't played to growing up as much. Topographic, I played that thing. So I felt like I had that one. That one was in the back, which was a surprise. But man, when we played that, I that was, that just, that probably gave me the same epiphany moment, Jimmy, that you were talking about with Billy. Right. Hearing that music and playing it with the guys, the band. I think it locked me in, man. I mean, for emotionally, for the whole ride. You know what I mean? Absolutely. There's lots of opportunities in the world. You could 
keep going for, but I, I feel like I've just got locked in emotionally now, you know? That's yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Well, that was you a know? great tour. And I, I yeah. that was a, a cool twofer. You know, for one thing, it was great to see Jeff playing music he wrote, you know? Um, yeah. Then, oh yeah. His here drama live was, was just a- It's intense. You know, yeah, well, really I, what, was really a blast really... too, what was really fun, too, is we had two occasions where we uh, played and uh, Trevor Horn came up on stage and we did uh, Tempest Fusion with him. And, you know, that was amazing. But when I, I looked across the stage and I, I went over to Trevor before the song kicked in, I said, finally, I'm in the buggles. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly, man. You just need some glasses like that now. Exactly, right? Yeah. Finally. Let's play L Street. Oh, that's too cool. Yeah. It's funny, Billy, you remember, we liked the Buggles before they joined Yes. Remember? I know. Yeah. I remember driving around with Mike, and, and we were way into the Buggles. That's right. We went to Ron Mancuso, turned us on to the Buggles. Yeah. yeah. So you guys and... were kind of digging that personnel change then, weren't you? It's kind of like okay. yes. Well, it was sure. it was definitely a shock to sort of see John gone because you know I'm a diehard fan and that was a shocker, and I'll never forget when I was anticipating hearing the new record they were going to play it on KLOS. I'll never forget. I, and I'm in my apartment and I'm waiting and I got the radio <clears> on <throat> and this song comes on, and it's Games Without Frontiers, Peter Gabriel. I didn't know. I wasn't aware of Gabriel's trip at that point. And when I heard Games Without Frontiers, I thought, oh my God, yes, sounds amazing. <laughs> right? <laughs> and, and so then I realized, wait a minute, the, the guy says, this is Games Without Frontiers, next up, yes. And then yes came on and it was, it blew my mind. I thought it was fantastic. Uh, wow. you know, but I'm a fan of, of the whole lot. You know what I mean? I'm not one of these, mm -hmm. there are diehards who won't, you know, listen to any Genesis without Gabriel and and vice versa. And yeah, I don't get into all that. I mean, I just follow the band on its journey and right. and appreciate it all. You know. So, Me were too. you aware as soon as you heard drama? Were you like, "That's the guy from the Buggles"? No, no. I mean, I, I I mean, I was aware that he was doing the gig by then because we'd been following the Buggles, but I wasn't thinking, "Wow, this sounds like the Buggles." It sounded like yes to me. Yeah. You know what I mean? I have to admit, when I first got into Yes, it was probably 82-ish, and a friend of mine loaned me Yes album, Fragile, Close to the Edge, and Drama. And I didn't really realize mm. for a number of years that it was a different singer, you know, mm. close enough yeah. to Anderson for me, you know. Well, those are some really? of the coolest choir bass lines ever, you know what I mean? I mean, and I was coming at yes from this angle of the bass you know what i mean i love the whole band always have i mean i started a drummer and used to wear the stan smith tennis shoes because i thought i'd play better like alan white does yeah <laughs> you know but once i keyed into the bass that's what drove me further into the band and um the bass lines are just ridiculous on that record oh, yeah. yeah and yes. alan's on fire too i mean the drum parts are insane they oh, are. Yeah. there's a lot of energy in that one. Oh, that's and Steve that is was yeah. That was a lot of fun to play live, man, because Billy and I had worked together so long. And there was basically three days of notice and then about eight, nine days of rehearsal to put this whole thing together. And Billy and I had played so much together that how precise the drama stuff is, you know, yeah. Yeah. into the lens is extremely yeah. precise, right? Mm -hmm. But we like to say if we threw a quarter note out into space, we both hit it at the same time, right? So all that stuff came together so quickly that it gave a lot of confidence to just it moving Nailed. forward. But it was like, with a lot of help, though, because that was a lot to digest. I always say that if Jay and I were in a room and the lights weren't on, we'd still hit the downbeat together. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, yeah, that was a great, great tour. You guys sounded amazing. Um, so tell me, Arc of Life, where did you get the title? Where did the name come from? Well, it's a funny thing. When you're trying to name a band, it's an absolute nightmare. Because not only are you constantly thinking of things and writing it down and rethinking new things, writing it down, but all your friends are piping in. And then it's also the concept of getting 
everyone in the band do a great, it's a nightmare from tip to tail. That said, there were a lot of names that we were until we arrived at this thing. And I don't know, I was just kind of sitting outside one day thinking about my own career path and how strange it's been. And the arc of that path, where it started, where it's going, who knows where it's going to end, hopefully not for a long time. Uh, and the idea of arc of a life doing the same thing in this arc pattern of nature and the day and how it, and so I just thought arc of life. And so I threw that out at the guys and also Derek Shulman, who was helping guide this thing. And it, the, everybody dug it. And I kept throwing other names out. Like, are you sure? Here's another one. Here's another one. Here's another one. Until it was finally like, okay, this is it. And I'm the most surprised how many people, I, and again, you know, doing all these interviews, I'm the most surprised how many people like this name. Thank goodness. So Godspeed. Yeah, it's cool. Does it <laughs> confuse it with an ARK? You know, like well, no see, this was my oh, this right. was part of my issue going when I came up with it. My first thought was, oh, this acronym and ARW was still active at that point. You know, they've since not right. been, and I didn't want to even open that door of association in terms of like why go there. And so that's why I was kind of against it. But it so happens that it took so long to get this thing going that there's a clear path now in terms of that problem for me and I'm, i don't you know it's it's not a problem okay well it's a cool name and um who did the cover art i believe the guys from the roger dean team um his okay. name is me right now and i feel horrible about that but i'm getting old and can't remember a lot of things so well, that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure this is totally coincidental, but to me, it looks like what Jesus saw the day they rolled the stone away. You well, know? I'll tell you, oh. I can tell you this, where it, the idea came from, you know, we started really thinking album cover right when the COVID was kicking into gear. And it was becoming like, whoa, what do you mean I can't leave my house? You know what I mean? And, and so... I started sort of imagining this dark place, this tunnel or cave that we're in here and looking out at what used to be this gorgeous landscape and this place that we had once. And so I sort of jotted down this idea of an archway and, and what I'm describing here. And I handed it off to those guys over there in England and they came back with what they came back with, which is absolutely gorgeous. And they came and you're like, no, that was feet, not inches. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not that back in particular. They really just, they got the feeling. And the other thing, I really wanted it to not feel like, look and feel like a Yes album cover because I've always done that with the bands that I'm in outside of Yes. I mean, it's kind of, I think, obvious at this point, World Trade cover looks not like a Yes album, as neither does Conspiracy, The Unknown, and, uh, you know, Circa and all these things. So, it was it was purposely like you know no floating islands let's just go another direction here and so i think with that as the mission statement they came up with something really unique and beautiful and i hope to see it on a t-shirt somewhere to gig soon <laughs> yeah oh, yeah no doubt cafe press make it happen right <laughs> well it would be kind of cool if you guys could open for yes has anybody thought of that well, I mean, we're a long way from, from any doing anything like that. happening right but. now, so who knows what could happen. But, you know, I would never say no to anything. I mean, I never imagined in a million years I'd be opening and warming up the band I'm in afterwards, <laughs> i.e. Asia. You know, it was very funny because we, Jeff and I would be standing there in the line with Steve on the last tour, you know what I mean, when he joined us. And the three of us would be standing there before going on stage with Yes, and we'd turn around to the other guys and go, we've warmed them up really nicely for you guys. <laughs> <laughs> is there any Asia on the horizon or is it kind of There is you know, dialogue path? of Asia next time there's, you know, when the world comes back, there's there's dialogue right now of, of doing things for sure. Okay. And when, were you, when you were here last time, remember you just moved into your house. It was the 4th of July. Pretty yes. Well, hardly unpacked anything. Um, and uh, you had mentioned that there was a new Circa record somewhere in the works. Is that still? Uh... Uh, there's going to be a Circa record downrange. Uh, you know, we're talking about how to do it and, and getting things going. Um, but right now, obviously, Arc of Life is 
taken so much energy and, and of our time to get it together that, you know, this is kind of where we're living right now, but I've been speaking with TK about it and there's definitely, we're contracted to do another one anyway. Um, Valley of the Windmill came out and was quite well received. So we'll definitely be making more circa music. You know, Tony's a huge part of that factor and, and shifting the trajectory of the sound and the style. So, um, you know, it's, it's something he wants to do too, which is great. You know, speaking of Tony, there's a great interview in Rolling Stone with him this week. There yeah. is, and he was very sweet and very kind very with the things he was saying, which was, was very cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm proud to see he remembers the fact that I pulled him out of retirement. Uh, it was like 2004 and I was working on tribute records one after the other. And I thought, Tony K, what the hell is he doing? You know? And so I called him. It's like, dude, do you want to play some keys? And he goes, I'm playing tennis. I don't play keys anymore. I said, you're doing that. <laughs> I'm so glad and you talked to him. From that point forward, man, we just rebonded and restarted working together. And obviously there's a nice legacy of circa music now to reflect that, you know? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It was a great article. I thought, I thought the article was really good. Tony, it, I, I, I've known Great job. Tony from before Billy, 1981. We got yeah. together and started working. Wow. Yeah, in Badfinger and, uh, you know, doing some stuff that he was producing. And, yeah, it's been a long, long relationship. But it was a great interview. I thought the Rolling Stone, he was really good. Yeah, it's like, what's gotten into Rolling Stone lately? They're actually... Yeah, interesting people. <laughs> and you, yeah, yeah, getting into, yeah. You know, it's like, I better late than never. Well, Tony, come talk to me sometime. I'd love to chat. So, oh, he'll do that. Fingers he'll crossed. Speak. I'd love that. I'm working my way through the yes camp, one by one. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so tell us a little bit about the recording of the record. Was this, I'm guessing, was any of this done before COVID came and soured things, or was it all done at a distance? Well, it started in the songwriting and the framework of things was developed inside that. Um, you know, I always have samples of my kick snares, my DWs and stuff. So when I'm writing, I'm not writing with a click or a drum machine. I'm, I'm actually using real drums and framing things. But that's how we start with the writing. And then basically John and I did all the vocals in the back of the bus. And also when we had a break um, on a yes tour here in LA, John had a house, we set up shop. So that's where all the vocals came from. Jay and I got together here in LA and recorded all the rhythm section stuff so that we had that visual contact going and real live thing going on. Mm -hmm. And um, then Jimmy and Dave kind of had to do file share stuff simply because of the geography. Jim was up in Utah. He had an unfortunate thing where his house was burned down here in LA. Oh, and Dave was in Florida where he lives and resides. So kind of a hybrid of old school and new school how it came right. together and it worked out quite well yeah i think it did um we also did some stuff together billy and i in my house that was half burned remember billy oh really i yeah. forgot about sessions yeah that's, that's right. right that's is, right and, is that and, and where you, we, is that where you we played a lot of like like you know uh one-on-one -on -one. We working on i think we were working on therefore we are or something at that point or lockdown or something yeah yeah one of the two little epics on here uh, you know this has got mm -hmm. some good variety you know you've got some kind of straight up pop and then you have some more poppy proggy stuff that uh, you're so well known for um i was wondering how do you go about arranging a tune like therefore we are well therefore i am <laughs> therefore i am is that what it is yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. I, I haven't. I haven't looked at the record. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Get up with the song. Huh? <laughs> um, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's a style that we all bring to the table, and that style is, I think, a shared thing between us as sort of being in a proggy sort of musical lane, where we want to experiment with things, even if they're simple. And so, by connecting melody and hooks with simple ideas and then making them complex, you start arranging it that way and you, and you get kind of a unique thing going on. I mean, I, I've been saying for this record in these interviews, which is true, is it's a, it's a balance between simplicity and, and complexity and finding that line that makes sense musically to be 
rewarding to a listener who doesn't know music and also challenging enough for musos, for lack of a better word, to be listening to and going, oh man, listen to the drums right there. So it's, a, it's kind of finding those tricks and turns inside the arrangement that really help. And the general feeling of the song being longer coming from, we're not done yet. It doesn't feel done yet, you know? Yeah. Do you ever like chop it up and like assemble it in different orders in Pro Tools when you're arranging or is it? Um, I did a bit of that with Derek Shulman in the early days of the construction work of the songs. Uh, he had ideas about repeating this and duplicating that and taking this part and moving it over here. And so I kind of did some of that with Derek actually. And then once we agreed, there it is, you know, then I was off and running and, and we were, you know, starting to record things, but we did frame a lot of this uh, with Derek's help. And he really, you know, he's got kind of a co-producer on this thing, really. Okay. Excellent. You know, Okay. I kept coming to him at points and going, I hope this isn't too gentle giant, but what can I do? Right. Is there <laughs> such a thing as too gentle giant? I say bring it on. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah, you know, uh, Love gentle giant. Let the, let the chips fall where they may. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Good luck finding one. That's what yeah. I say. Yeah. yeah. Let the downbeat fall where is it may. <laughs> it's like most people play in 4 4 or 7 8. Gentle giant plays in one. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yep. <laughs> so the opening track, Life Has a Way, and that was a remake of one you had called In the End. Uh, is that right? How that did... is one tune I pulled from the past and we reworked it in a way because I always felt like that song had another way to be done. And so when we were kind of in the early stages, John and I were listening to music together and I played some stuff from that record and he said, wow, this tune, you know, and so that got me thinking maybe there's a way to bring this to the table another way and so it's uh an interesting arrangement and a more sort of aggressive attitude on it where the original is very lethargic and very slow and takes a long time to develop which i i dig and it lives great like that but i don't know that that was the one song that was pulled sort of from some other area that we just did because it felt like the right thing to do yeah, well, I think it sits well with the rest of the record and, and gets things going with a real earworm. So, yeah, cool one. and it's a good, powerful message, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, life does have a way. I mean, the funny thing is, in, in the song, is I, I kind of borrowed that from, from Jeff Goldblum in Jurassic Park when he says, I, I'm simply saying life finds a way. <laughs> Indeed. And I thought, that's a cool concept, you know. So... Okay. Do you guys use Siri much, or is that kind of something that was more popular when you started writing the song three years ago? Well, I mean, I use Siri religiously because uh, I can't see much. Yeah, what do you talk to her about? Well, it so happens that the way that song came about, I was we were on tour in Europe somewhere, and I come back from the gig having been to hospitality longer than I might have needed to and come <laughs> back to my room and ask Siri, can you please set the alarm for 7.30 a.m., you know, to get ready to wake up in two hours? And she says, yes, your alarm's set. And I just kind of instinctively said, thank you. And she said, you're welcome. And I said, so what are you up to? And she went, nothing. What are you doing? And I started talking to this thing. And, and then I started <laughs> thinking how silly that was. And that got my mind reeling. And so I just wanted to keep going on this conversation and not let go of it, see where it could go. So I started asking it deeper things and I asked it, do you dream? And it said electric sheep, but only sometimes. I was like, whoa, that's trippy. Like somebody uh, was expecting that question. It, it, it's <laughs> kind of, I think that quote's from a Vonnegut book. It's, it's kind of out there to put it in there. Yeah. And then after that, I asked- Blade it, Runner. Blade Runner, there you go. And then I asked it, do you, do you dream? or do you love and it said who me and it's kind of at that point that i realized wait a second i need to start writing some things down here and sketch it out and so i sketched it out showed it to john and he said i love this let's go and so that's where that came from but it's very much just something we all do in daily lives but it, it was just a funny conversation it's a fun song and, uh, and it you know it's, it's slightly humorous you know i think it shows you guys don't take yourselves too seriously 
you know. I know. Well, it's it's, t- it's kind of meant to be lighthearted, but it's also meant to be a little weird and scary in the way that, <laughs> like, people who are very lonely will fall in love with their AI and mm-hmm. having these relationships, you know. Which they've made movies about. And then that movie yeah. we love, Ex Machina. Well, right? yeah, there, there's another film that Joaquin Phoenix is in called Her where he yeah. falls in love with his AI and it gets really weird. And, and so all those thoughts were in my head about just how compelling this concept of AI has become. And one day there will be a robot in front of you and you just have a conversation like it's C-3PO. I mean, that's where we're going. You know I think I mean? it's going to start with a pet first, right? Like this yeah. robot yeah, like, dog. Yeah, like that dog from Boston <laughs> Dynamics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> enough. That thing's frightening. Go look at that thing. Know, <laughs> put some fur on it, man. <laughs> yeah, it's already got the teeth. Just put the fur on it. <laughs> Very cool. Well, that's, a, that's a fun one. Um, I've actually experimented with that concept of a songwriting thing in on this second Citizen record. There's a song called Sophia, and it's about the fact that this AI robot that they've got the human form on and everything has actually become the first legitimate citizen of uh, either Dubai or the United Arab yeah. Emirates. Oh, that's scary. And, and it's like this thing is there and real. And, and so there's a concept there too of like falling in love with it, but this is kind of scary and, you know, all those things, which I think most people think about. I mean, we all know it's going to be amazing, but we all consider the Skynet at the same time. <laughs> so. so I'm really digging the vocals on here and, and the harmonies and such. Um, and in a way, it kind of reminds me of what you did with Chris. Um, but it's almost like you've kind of taken the Chris role. And John's kind of taking yours. On the more well, That's an interesting of- observation and pretty cool. Um, I think the main thing that was intriguing for John and I going into this was let's think about these vocals going right down the middle and I'll go this way at a point, I'll go this way and then we'll cross over and, and use both voices to add character and depth to the project and have that sort of super tramp thing going where you had the two different voices or Pink Floyd or the Eagles and the band, Genesis, you know, in the early days. Well, that's cool. I like the way you split it up. I don't think there's any one song where just one guy sings the whole thing, you know. You, you yeah. Of... And what I'm looking forward to is, you know, obviously getting this band on the road and touring is something that we all want to do. And then the next album, uh, getting into a room together and starting to write together as a team because all the guys are really talented writers. Well, a question and, then, <laughs> and then using those voices even more of Jim Dave to, to bring into the party here a bit more. So there's a lot of potential in that, you know? Absolutely. Yeah. Well, there was a question in the chat room wondering if you all would write as a team on the next album. It sounds like you plan to. So that's, that's cool. Yeah. That's the plan. That's very cool. Um, Once COVID ends in 2047. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, no, that seed's going to work. I, I'm just sure of it. So just hang in there. It better. Yeah, no doubt. Uh, does, do you know anybody that's got it yet? Uh, yeah, I know a few people yeah. have had it yeah. and yeah. recovered, but yeah. they had it. They said it was super gnarly. Yeah, well, no, it, well, how about the vaccine? I've, I've, yeah, my, my, my wife has gotten her first shot, and she'll have her second one March 2nd. And my mom got her first shot, and she'll have hers, uh, like, on the 3rd, March 3rd. And the, the reactions have been nil to nothing, really. A sore arm. Oh, yeah. Maybe just a tiny bit of chills for... 25 minutes or something and that's it wake up in the morning and it's a new day just no problem well i hear the second one's a little a little harder to deal with but even that will pass in a day or two usually. yeah <laughs> I, i've heard the same thing yeah, um yeah. Our my mom Charlie. got the second one uh it was fine okay. was yeah. my mom did it too my, yeah. Mom's yeah. Got- my mom got the first second my sister got the first so Mm-hmm. Uh, everything's great, though. I mean, I've you know I've been in total contact and no problems. Yeah, that's good. That's yeah. really good. It has to 
be coming to, I think we're closer to the end than we are closer to the beginning. Let's put at, it that way. At this point, I think you're right. I can see light at the end of the tunnel and it's not, oh, yeah. it's not a train, thankfully. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we, we want to all get on the road and play. We're dying and itching to do it. So as soon as that opens up, you know, I'm sure we're not alone in being artists that are dying to get back out there. I mean, I think once the key is turned and it opens in that way, it's going to look like, you know, Black Friday at Walmart. With people <laughs> right. Get out there. No, That's no. true. No, no. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's for sure. Yeah, no doubt. Um, <laughs> so, Jimmy, what, uh, what are the main guitars you used on the Arc of Life album? Are you talking to me? Yes. Uh, I used. Um, you can even grab them and show them to us, dude. I, I, you know what? I have a, a Rickenbacker twelve string that I. I mean, I have. I've really fallen in love with the twelve string. Okay, and I think that like, I, I like to do solos on it. I, I like it so much more than actually just regular guitar because it's a different. It's a whole different animal. So so it's gonna sound different, you know. Sure, and yeah. I just love doing solos on it because I can't bend notes. I can't like make it over distorted. I can't do any of this stuff. So I used a lot of 12 string on that album. Yeah, um, that's really cool solos. Yeah, I, I have a couple of, uh, I have a couple of uh, double neck, like 12 strings here. Yeah, um, see one here, yeah, the blue one there. Is that PRS? That, yeah, it's a PRS, and then I've got a. Um, it's like the John McLaughlin model. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It was modeled. I didn't realize there was more than one. Oh yeah. Well, it's a left-handed. Yeah. I, I had a custom made, and then and I've got a, a Gibson over there. Okay. Yeah, yeah. The classic yeah. Stairway to Heaven. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But that's that's the one I think I used probably mostly on the. Uh, um, uh, Arc of Life was was that one and and the um uh the Rickenbacker. Yeah, you know I like because I just I just got the PRS. Oh wow, That's yeah. Beautiful. You know I like the sound of a twelve string with a humbucker. You know I think it kind of warms it up a little bit. You know I've had a few uh -huh. twelve strings where they have like single coils and it always sounds a little a little a little thin. You know so yeah, the double neck is uh, the way to go for a good tw fat twelve string. Well, you know what? I, I, I loved like 11 Miles High, you know, um, sure. and and of course, Awaken that Steve did. And I've always loved that sound, man. And just like how when you solo on those things, it's it's a whole different thing. It's, you know, so I really used a lot of that. And uh, and I have a Les Paul, I think I used and, uh, uh, you know, of course, a Strat here and there. Well, I think this all, I forget what song it is, but one of the songs has kind of made me think of Awaken, you know, uh, just the really ripping yeah. it up on the 12 string. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And, you know, I, I always, I, I love amplifiers. So I, I just always have to push air. You know, I, I love to just, uh, I mean, I, you know, and not saying that uh, plugins are bad, but, you know, I just love the sound of like an, an amp mic you know, different ways. And uh, yeah, so there's a lot of that. So yeah, it's pretty much, I think just three guitars, you know. Um, and that acoustic, whatever that acoustic is that you've got. I don't know if that's a Martin or what. Yeah, what <clears throat> yeah. Right. Don't forget the acoustic. You don't can't forget, forget the acoustic. The acoustic. Yeah. <laughs> you got some really tasty tones on there. Kudos. Um, hey, Dave, what boards did you use? I'm, there's a couple of things. First of all, uh, Billy and I share in common the IK Multimedia software stuff, uh, which I guess uh, that and some of the hardware was probably your portable studio, right? Yeah. Billy? Yeah. Yep. So, uh, so, you know, I, I use Sample Tank and Centronic, Miroslav and things like that. And then this is my keyboard rig. So I've got kind of like a Nord thing going on and, and different stuff. But, you know, for, for this album, it, you know, I was added late and the songs were already written. And I think, you know, usually for me, I'm pretty heavy handed with keyboards, like in Sound of Contact and other stuff when I'm part of the writing process. But here, uh, I think, you know, there's just so much going on 
great stuff going on with vocals, vocal harmonies, lots of guitars that, you know, the keyboards don't uh, take over. It's not like a very keyboard prominent album per se. Next album will be. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> there they are, yeah. <laughs> Fair <Hey>. warning. <laughs> Bring it on. Bring oh, it on. God. Should I be scared? It's gonna be. It's gonna be like a conversation. <laughs> There's a great conversation on on a uh, video of them work of yes working on Tormato where Chris is looking at Rick going, "There's more bass than bass down there." It's, it's, it's kind of like you, if you play keys with a bass player plays like I do, you can't use the stuff from middle C down. That's all you have to promise me. <laughs> I love it. I love it. That's amazing. So good. You know, that but you know, like album. when yeah. when we play live, I mean, I don't know what other songs, you know, there's just this one album. So I would imagine we'll play songs from individual catalogs for many of us uh, yeah. and, and some yes. And um, Gates. I have to say, because I've never played. I mean, we, I <laughs> yeah. produced uh, co-produced a tribute. A yes, tribute album with uh, Fernando Perdomo and Billy John Jay was on that. I didn't know Jimmy yet or it would have been great to have Jimmy on there, too. Uh, hey. But um, but I've never done it live. I mean, apart from like some of those cruise to the edge parties or but even then, actually, I think we were planning on doing something really cool with the fish and then it, it's not the right place. So I haven't really had a chance to play any yes songs. So I hope and I love Rick Wakeman. I love Je I love Jeff Downs. He's a good friend and, and a hero of mine. And uh, and I love Tony Kay and Patrick Moraz. I love all those guys. I'm like uh, mm -hmm. Billy in the sense that like. I, you know, the Trevor Raven years, like I like it all, you know, I mean, especially like I'm not biased. I love drama. It's one of my favorite records. Um, and I love, you know, of course, going for the one. And so to play anything like from Awaken or South Side of the Sky, one of the most brilliant piano solos ever. Uh, I'm I again, it's not up to me. It's like a band decision or, you know, the, and I'm the. I'm the you know, just my tiny little vote, but you know, I vote for some of those kind of tunes because it's just uh, well, you wonderful know, keyboard playing opportunity. Well, I, th I think what we might do is, you know, because we don't want to play the same music Yes is playing on tour and known for. That would be pointless, you know. That's right. what Yes. And um, if anybody has seen the chronological journey, which was a piece that's what that I was. It was a piece that was with Circa and. The reason it came about was Circus first record that we made was 50 minutes long and we were being booked for two hours. So it was like, holy cow, what the hell do we do? So I came up with this idea of, of stitching together chronologically just the instrumental hooks, if you will, that we all as Yes fans know and tune into. And they flow into one into the other. And we, we ended up playing this amazing 40 minute piece that was a mother to get together. It's a monster. We actually did it quite well on the very first take, which happened to be captured on video. So maybe something like that might be interesting to reintroduce. And it's yeah, respectful to yes. I remember every note. Yeah. You know, I it's know. respectful to, 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 to Arc of Life because we're not trying to be yes. And so we don't want to go out there and do that. There's no point. But we obviously are known as the yes guys too. So there is a part of the people coming who are going to want to feel that vibe. And I think that's a nice compromise, that junk chronological journey. And a lot of people like it. So oh, it's that'd be great. something that would get a, a good response. Well, you know, medleys usually grind my gears because you only get a little bit of everything and it just leaves you wanting more. But you guys yeah. made it, you know, where you gave it everybody. It was it yeah. Chunk. yeah, and you got those good moments. And, you know, we could expand things and whatnot. And especially with John there, you know, we could really expand things but i think that might be something that we do if we're playing to you know to uh, uh, in a show environment that requires that much time you know yeah. in a perfect world we open up for cold play for a half an hour and mm -hmm. go around the planet so let's exactly. just see what happens. <laughs> that was good exactly yeah. yeah i love that medley and you know i think <clears throat> the coolest things about it was seeing tony play that stuff from the first two albums for the first time yeah like, yeah. yeah i mean you know. that was yeah. a very special thing all the way around because you know it was really well played by everybody and alan was just kicked it's you know kicked oh, it yeah. yeah it, it, it just cool. the thing had an energy that was all its own and 
what I dug about it the most was no one has ever done that. And so it makes it a unique way to present playing yes music for us at the time. And it may just very well work again for art. Yeah, I yeah. think it's worth repeating because it was it was really neat. You might want to tack a little more on the end of it now. Right. Well, we've, we've yeah, gone, we, may need now, to... we stopped at 2000, I think, on the journey. And now, you know, it's, right. it's been a long time. There's a lot in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That would be cool. That would be cool. Well, let's see how that all ends up. Fingers crossed. Um, got a couple questions here. Um, could you ask Squids about the third In Continuum project that has John Davison on it? Is that still something coming down the pike, or oh, the third album? Yeah, yeah. I've kind of put it on the back burner because I have too much meat on the grill at the moment. Um, <laughs> I, it's just insane, you know. And I, and I feel sort of like you can't have your pudding if you don't eat your meat. So that's um, a quote from the wall. But uh, it's kind of like I need to get everything that's been pre-ordered done and delivered to everybody. And then the fun stuff, my favorite thing is, is writing and producing and stuff. So I, I decided on that. I'm just going to work slow. I'm, I am writing with John for some other things. Um, and he did already sing on some in continuum stuff. And But because of COVID and that particular band, it's more of like a ensemble of like a just – top players like Marco Miniman and Nick DiVirgilio and Gabriel Gudo who lives in Argentina and Leticia Wolf, you know, people scattered all over the, even further across the globe. And, you know, like, let's say with Gabriel, I like it when he's a vocalist is in person, people could send in tracks, but vocals, I like to be there in person and drums. Well, no drums. I usually don't get to, but anyway, so he can't travel here and, so it's just kind of, you know, working remotely, is, you know, it depends. Like some of us who work together remotely work amazing together. I don't know what it is. It's just a chemistry like Billy and I, we've been working together for years and it's just fast. And we like, you know, we know we have the same vocabulary. I don't know what it is, but uh, other times it's like, you got to be there. So uh, for those, this is one of them. So I'm just kind of like, you know what? We, I, I've got this box set with the live uh, album that from a recording we did at Prague Stock, and that'll be this year and maybe next year another In Continuum album. I am doing a solo record though, with ironically a lot of the people from In Continuum and songs I wrote for Sound of Contact. And actually, I just talked to Simon Collins, and he agreed to let me use a couple drum tracks from the Sound of Contact sessions on the record. So that's cool. I, I've got like I said, enough to work on this year to not like add too much to it. But uh, yeah, either way, you know, have to keep you busy then. Okay. Yeah. And uh, Jimmy question for you. Um, can you tell us anything about the aborted 2013 sessions with you, John Anderson, Jonathan Elias and Michael Sherwood? Mm. Yes. And, yes. Jim, uh, please tell me about that. Please tell <laughs> you know what dude I, all i can tell you it's so fucking great the music is so good and um john i believe and he even said it it got a little too froggy for him and it was it was it was a little too getting into his old you know way of of doing music like you know like progressive and he was getting into something different at that point. I remember he, he loved this band Battles at this point. He's like, can we do something like Battles? And, and I remember it was just this simple like uh, indie band. And and we had just done all this great work. And and with Billy's brother, Michael, who did some amazing stuff. And it was John with uh, John Elias and... Uh, I, I loved the music and, but, but I think it was just too, John didn't want to go down that road again. You know, he was just like, I, I want to just let's, let's do something else. So, so I still, I have these recordings and God, it just like, God, I would love to one day be able to show people this because it was amazing stuff, man. I mean, you mentioned him not wanting to go down that road because I had a similar experience in working with John Wetton. Okay. Um, 
I got called in to do to make his solo album, Raised in Captivity. And he came to my place and we co-wrote the whole thing together and recorded it all in 30 days. I played a bunch of stuff and we farmed out solos and stuff. But it was basically just he and I. And when we got together on day one, in my head, I'm coming to the table like danger money. Here we go. Here we <laughs> <Right>? go. Yep. <laughs> he's like, I could it, imagine. When we yeah. start sitting down to talk about writing, he's like, so really simple. And I was like, what, wait, what, what? <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, it was his record and, you know, wisely in his career, he knows what he's doing, obviously. So I fit into his mold and we started writing and, and, and went off from there. But I was in that same mindset of like, wow, wait a minute. You know, I kind of thought we were going to listen to Red and then just go for it. <laughs> yeah. You know? Oh, and it was beautiful. And, you know, John was very much a part of everything and, and he was loving it, loving it, loving it. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it was like but, but, he but, but, changed but. his mind, and he wanted uh, to do like reggae and stuff. And I, it was like, what? Wait, okay. mm -hmm. uh, well, hopefully one day he'll change his mind. I mean, it must have been really disappointing to go through all that. And, and, oh, it was. Like, wait, no. Oh, it was like, so. What are you doing, dude? Come on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, but but the music is there, so I don't know. Maybe one day he'll be like, let's just do it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um. So what's the best place to get the new album at? Well, as I understand it, um, the pre-order is sold out, which is a good thing. Who knows? Uh, you know? And so what happened was, is the distributors got caught a little unawares. And like when it comes time to unlock the doors and it's time to sell it, they don't have any. Yeah. So people have to find it now. Um, oh. That said, you can still order it directly from Frontiers Records. Uh, and there's a few other outlets that are written with a bunch of HTTP things involved that I can't really remember off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. But if you go to, you know, CD Baby, Amazon, and you can order it and it'll just come to you when it comes to you. It's available, but they just don't have it in stock. So, you know, I suppose there are worse problems to have. Yeah, put it in a back order. And what yeah. audience do you feel like this is aimed at? Is it... Uh, for me personally, anyone who enjoys listening to music played by hand by real people and, uh, you know, in that genre that we know, but personally, I feel like I'm always trying to push forward of that envelope and bring some energy to that genre that's maybe not there in other formats. You know, I feel like so, the whole pro thing is can be a bit of a prison of expectations sometimes. Well, I think that in general, you know, you say the word prog, generally people are immediately thinking mini moves, solos, and you know, meters, um, lyrics that are floaty and dreamy and whatnot. And I don't subscribe to that so much. I mean, I'm rooted in not only in Prague in my desire to listen to music, but you know, if you ask me, the police were really a progressive rock band and just mislabeled. Very true. You know? And and there are plenty of other bands like that that I can name. I mean, you know, Utopia, well, they're I guess they're considered Prague, but uh, you know, uh, Genesis was always in the rock section in the record stores, you know, it's like, what? So, I think just pushing forward in the genre and trying to bring something new to it is to refresh the genre and bring a younger audience in if possible. I mean, there's a lot of people that I've met surprisingly now, I guess, cause I'm getting old, you know, when we're doing the meet and greet, the 20 year old kid shows up with his bro and one guy's got close to the edge and the other guy's got the ladder and you know they want it signed, and, and they're into yes. And I always look at them and say, "How old are you guys?" <laughs> you know, <laughs> well, we're twenty. I'm like, well, how did you figure this out? You know, so there is a, a a new sort of generation that's tuning into progressive rock, and I think that's good because it's getting out there in, in strange ways. For instance, my kid who's just about to turn eighteen comes up to me and and says, "I just discovered this new thing called." 21st century schizoid man and it's blowing my mind <laughs> i said how did you find that i mean i've been trying to tell you to have that as long as i'm trying to get you to eat pizza and you still won't do it how how are you hearing this music and he said he's listening to he's watching anime and in the anime series they use the 70s kind of soundtrack so 
he's naming off all these tunes that I was telling him about years ago, but he just, you know, dad doesn't know what he's talking about. <clears throat> else so that's coming from different angles and but it's pushing the genre forward which is kind of cool and of course you've got all the dads and the moms who are still devoted to the progressive rock sort of genre and the bands they're in and so they indoctrinate their kids in their way and i think it's it's i mean let's let's put it this way i remember me and jay being at a convention for the world trade out remember jay oh yeah i sure we do. walked in the room and we were like wow is this genre still alive or what are we doing here? <laughs> I know. And somehow here we Picked are. The wrong. 21, <laughs> still talking about the genre. So it endures because this is where all the good stuff was created. You know what I mean? Yeah. 70s, 80s, 90s, rock and roll. Prague is where that all happened. I mean, obviously the Beatles were before that bringing the concept of exploration but Prague really refined itself in those years you know with Rush and all those other great bands and you know so that music's timeless as is Awaken and the Revealing Signs of God you know these things yeah. are timeless. Mm -hmm. Hey before we take off could you share a Chris Squire story with us maybe one that hasn't been told a whole lot <laughs> Oh boy, there's a few really funny ones that I cannot tell you, unfortunately. Uh -huh. <laughs> but um, I guess let me think about this. I, I th there's a story I've been telling because I've been asked this a couple times now, and I'm, I, I had to refine it to one that was, you know, PG. <laughs> right. We were filming the DVD for The Ladder in uh, Vegas, and up to there, through that tour, we had been playing Hearts, and I take the lead solo that Raven did, you know. And up to the, that show, there have been some incidents on stage where I'm, I'd be standing there, my guitar had cut out, I'd look around and I'd see, I'd realize Chris had kind of clomped his way over my zone and took out my cable <laughs> process. Not intentionally, but kind of became kind of silly, you know, to the point where we're backstage, I'm like, Chris, can you just look down when you pass me, you know what I mean? <laughs> So anyway, with that as the context, we go to film this shoot that night, right? And I specifically go to Chris, listen, when I go out, you could do it anywhere else you want to. But when I go out to do this solo in Hearts tonight, because we're filming and everything, I'm just going to be focused in on this thing, laser focus. <laughs> Please just look where you're standing and stay there. <laughs> don't move around, you know? That is so oh, funny. Oh, I got you, man. Don't worry about it. It'll be fine, you know, Chris. Okay, so we go to do the sh show, and you know, we get to the part, and this I play. Da -da 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 -da. <laughs> <laughs> I turn around and I look behind me, and he's just kind of standing there. His eyebrows are up really high, <laughs> standing on the cord. Kind of look, kind of looking at me. Oh my God, bless his heart. I uh, he <coughs> like he was my brother, but I tore his head off that night, all night through the hotel in Vegas. He'd come up to me, are you okay yet? I'm like, get away from me. Yeah. <laughs> That's really funny. <laughs> and then the next morning, you know, we'd be back in the van together and sitting there and I look at him, I'm like, you know, I love you, right? He's like, yeah, I'm sorry, man. And, you know. So we, we just move on, but I just, you know, it's one of those things where I just, I'll never yeah. forget turning around him, his, that grin with his eyebrows and sure. seeing his face and then focusing down. It was like a John Hughes movie. You know, <laughs> it's just like all I saw were these big stomping shoes he had on and standing on the table. He had like 300 square feet to work with. <laughs> I love it. On it. I got another one. Um, you know, I told Billy this, but um, I saw like the first show that the choir experiment did at that little shithole in Phoenix, the Mason Jar. Oh, you yeah, were there? I was there. Dude, yeah. that was me on guitar. Yeah. Yeah, I know. I was yeah. standing right in front of you. I was That's like, so I saw Paul, dude. Yeah. That was Paul. I yeah, think we right. did two shows that night. You did, yeah. Because and we had to do that and it was funny because i'll never forget the first show's over and i go out and I'm standing there with chris outside and we're just getting a breath of fresh air and the, the everyone who left out the exit door just wrapped around the building and came in the door again 
just went <laughs> and you know i thought i was a big yes fan but i met some diehards that night i mean they're like singing revealing science of god in the parking lot like a like that the a funniest band. story on that sh that tour you know we played me jimmy and mark williams were working on a record called the key that was actually finished it was on mca records and it was finished and two days before it was supposed to be released we got shelved because there was regime change totally heartbreaking a real drag mm. but long story short we were the opening act for the conspiracy thing that we are the squire experiment yeah, and there's one night we're playing that we were, up, we were up north in San Jose or somewhere like that, and I'm playing. I come out on stage. I'm playing, and there's this guy. He's kind of had a few drinks. He's just looking up on stage, going, "Can you hurry up and bring Chris out?" You know, and I'm, as we're playing this song, and I look down at him and we start chatting. I'm like, "Dude, you just chill." He's come, "Oh man, come on!" He just started like, "Get your band off stage." I said, I'm not sure you're going to like what happens. <laughs> and so <laughs> I came out and I came back on and stood in the same spot in front of him. I'm like, I'm back again, bro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Goes, Did you bring Chris? I said, yes, I brought Chris with me. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that set made up of, the, of the songs you guys played before Chris came on? Uh, it was some of the yes music, some of the uh world trade we played in the wake of the storm right we open your eyes the, we did some, some conspiracy stuff in that yeah. say goodbye ended up on the conspiracy record we did the yeah. more we live we did we actually did open your eyes but it was called wish i knew that's oh yeah cool. that's right yeah i remember that you guys played the whole set and then you didn't have anything left so you played that song again like, yes, I, I said to Chris at the time oh, yeah. we were rehearsing, isn't this a bit lazy and we should learn six minutes? He goes, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, well, it was interesting. It was almost like a glimpse into the future, like five years into the future. Like, this is what yes is going to be like, you know, in a lot of ways. Yeah. So. I mean, it certainly was something all the times that we shared together with Chris, which, you know, we've all done that now here. Have always been something I've looked back on and gone. God, I'm so glad we did that. I mean, one I of the know. things that we did that that Jay and I worked super hard on that people not, might not realize it, the conspiracy live DVD. Oh yeah, um, was almost just lost and was not going to see the light of day. But I was tenacious on the business front and found it a home. And Jay and I were super tenacious in that we sat and edited that thing for about six weeks from totally disjointed clips uh, the, the production factor was horrible in terms of how it was archived so we had just bags and massive bags amounts of massive with, amounts with of no cuts. markings of what was what we were looking through going i think that's him playing uh days of wonder because his hand goes up the neck and and we surgically put that all together out of the passion of the project really but by the end jay and i were like i said to jay I'm like i can't do any more of this <laughs> where can we see that at now i remember seeing it online maybe 15 years ago but uh well i believe that cleopatra records has the rights and is putting that out okay and that's and the one where he does hold out your hand and um, some of the stuff from fish out of water also right mm -hmm. yeah we did hold out your hand and the fish fish out of water and... i've got a funny story about hold out your hand yeah. right <clears throat> That was a track that I would have been just thrilled to do, right? It wasn't slated for us to do it, but I would I was charting it out during the day and we'd get together for rehearsals and I would just work my chart. And Billy knew what I was doing. And then Chris started paying attention. He's going, what, what do you got there, you know? He took a look at it and he goes, eh, you know, all oh, right, right. So we just got on with business. But every day I would come back with a, fuller and fuller chart more and more done and then one he just started playing with me right and then he went oh enough of that now back to the other stuff and i thought okay that's good so now the chart's finished i'm ready to go the whole way and he comes uh -oh. welcome to the covid world of <laughs> guitar part one one more time you, you froze for a second there you oh, throw it right at the best part. I know, it's yeah, like, yeah. Oh, when when uh, where did I get like where did I get cut off? Um, you was something about when you were fourteen. No, 
14. No, you, you finally finished charting it out. You finally finished. Uh, it's when Chris discovered you finally he committed to playing that track with you. Well. Yeah, yeah, because he started singing. Go yeah. through. So then Billy came up with a really great guitar part. That was cool. Oh, I'm glad you guys included that. That's, you know, that's such a magical record. And just to see Chris. Uh, there's another funny story that Jimmy will probably remember. Um, well, maybe you weren't there, though, Jim. Were you? I was playing guitar, actually. That's right. Because Chris was playing bass. You mean with Michael? Yeah, my brother, who was, you know, he, <laughs> he was funny in many ways. A super talented guy, but, you know, he had his ways. And so, you know, day one of the rehearsal, I invite Mike to join the band and come play, you know. And so day one of the rehearsals, we set up and he puts his keyboards right next to my amps. And we literally, like, I played chord one, boom. And Mike goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's so loud, you know. And, and I'm like, well... Um, not really to me. What, what are we going to do about this? Well, can you turn your amp? So it starts with turning the amp, and then he moves three feet over there. It ended up with him behind us, 20 feet behind my buddy who owns this rehearsal studio has what looks like the monoliths in 2001, but they're made of foam. There's just these big black, I call them the monoliths. There's two of them. Finally, Mike's behind two of these, and you can see him. And he's like, then he's just, it's still a problem for him. So I went over and squeezed these things together until it was like, if you needed to make eye contact with him, you had to come up and kind of do <laughs> Are you okay in there? Okay, good. Here comes the chorus. Oh my God, it was so funny. You so can relate to some of that stuff. My God. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. That good times. So, and again, you know, Having that not only for Chris but now for Mike too, you know, it's it's just an amazing chunk of history right there. And what's really bizarre about it that some of the fans who follow our thing here might not know is that we worked really hard for that. And right at the tail end of that, and we were getting ready, we had offers to go out on tour and to do things. Chris comes up to me and says, "I'm moving to England." And I'm reforming the sin. And, and it was at that point that I was like, wait, Chris, what? You're doing what? And so he just kind of went another trajectory at that point. Right. We kind of just went, well, what can we do? You know, he lives in England. And he wants to pursue the sin. Right. I think he and would it, have been better off with you guys. Of course he would have. <laughs> you know, and I feel the same way with the John Anderson thing. It was just like, dude, what are you doing? I mean, this is such an amazing piece, you know, amount of work. Well, I got, I got why Chris wanted to do it in terms of like rekindling his original band and stuff like that. But it got kind of silly in that, you know, bless him. He calls me and says, can you play with us? And I said, what do you mean? Wait, what? Can, can you come play with us? I'm like, wait, I'll, I'll play with you in Circa, but I'm not going to join the Sin. What are you talking right. about? Right. Well, I was thinking you and Jay, you know, join. And I'm like, wait, well, well, hang on. You know what? <laughs> so I passed and let him do his thing. And then the next thing I know, Jay's calling me. And he's like, he wants me to do the sin. I'm like, the same guy who just left us hanging? Hang on a minute. Yeah. <laughs> oh, but what do you think? So I it know. kind of worked out in a weird way where I was completely confused what was going on. And as we know, it kind of ended where it ended. Um, but, you know, that was Chris. He would do things like that. You know what I mean? Yeah. To know him was to love him. Let's put it that way. You know? Yeah. Absolutely. Well, he, we definitely miss him. It's a cool yeah, video, yeah. though. It's a cool video. Oh, it's a great thing oh, yeah, to have. Right. It's yeah. an amazing piece every, of history. Every, every Yes fan needs a copy of that. So I hope, it, I hope it's re-released somehow. It'd be great to pop it in the old DVD player. Sure. Yeah. So anything else you guys want to share before we wrap it up tonight? Well, I'm going to have ravioli with a pesto sauce here. In a oh, bit. sounds good. Can sounds we have good, some Billy. of that? Bring it over. That sounds yeah. good. I don't know if any of you guys are into the impractical jokers, but like they've been reduced to this Zoom call thing. You know, and it's like to sit uh, around and eat dinner all night long. But it feels a little like that. I'm going into my... <laughs> well, very cool. Well, we are excited about the new record again uh you can pick up the new record at, at just google it and find your way there it's 2021 i'm sure all the gonna... obvious proggy <laughs> sources it should be there okay. yeah. and again you know um apologies for john not being able to make this i mean 
we've been texting when he can back and forth and it, his connection spotted because he's in Barbados or something and there was like a oh or, you know some storm blew his power and his wi-fi out so oh, okay of course well, he could not make it but i know he wanted to be here we'll, like, we'll do it again with john you know yeah, that'd be great yeah. Yeah. anytime you guys are always welcome to come back well cool beans all right well coming up friday i'm chatting with dixie dregs bassist andy west and uh saturday i'm chatting with david sanctus and the following week i'm chatting with chad wackerman so Sweet. Got lots of cool guys. stuff coming up soon. So, hey, it's always a pleasure hanging out with you guys. And please come back anytime. And uh, I hope you have a good, uh, good spring. You know? Well, thanks for having Me us. Too. And thanks for the, the love for ARC. And, and we hope that people who hear it enjoy it and listen to it and get a positive vibe from it. And come yeah, see it. I hope the t-shirts happen. I think somebody should put on the back, ARC it up. <laughs> there you go. ARC it up. <laughs> Alrighty. Well, you guys right, take right. care. Stay safe. All right. And uh, right, guys, come back anytime. All right, y'all. Yeah, See you guys. Later, guys. All right. Thanks, Sean. Nice. 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 Yeah, See you go. All right, guys. Bye.